I'm so thankful to be here with you guys. Um, real quick, before we dive into the message, I just want to open in prayer. So if you would, bow with me. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, you are good. You are merciful. And we thank you for that. God, I pray right now that you would allow me to play the background. That you would speak through me. God, I pray your Holy Spirit over this place right now that you touch the hearts of many and that we trust that you can do so much more than we could ever imagine. We love you, Father, and we thank you. We pray this in your Son's holy, precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, church. So we kicked off a new series last week. Do you remember what we talked about? Scandalous love. Reuben remembers. Love. His idea of love, and I told you over these next few weeks, we're going to talk about um, loving ourselves, loving others, God's love for us. And so last week, we talked about loving ourselves. And when I had this mirror on the stage, and when I first got up here, it had all sorts of nasty words on it in black. It had, you know, dirty, neglected, abused, sinner, broken, all these different things. And I expressed to you guys that a lot of times we wake up in the mornings, We come in contact with a mirror, we look in that mirror, and we allow ourselves to be labeled by what others have said about us, or what we actually think about our own selves. There's always a character flaw, there's always something that we look at and we're like, man, I don't like that. And we work through these different verses, and these different passages, and we talked about this man by the name of Moses. And if you remember correctly, Moses was in the desert, he came across... A bush that was on fire. And though it was on fire, it wasn't burning away. And he got to the bush, and suddenly the bush started talking to him, and it was God. And God said, Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt to free my people, the Israelites. And you remember what Moses said immediately? God, I can't. I can't do it. And God says, Moses, I'm with you. And he goes, but God, I can't speak well. I'm a nobody, and I'm just not good enough. And God says, Moses, did you not hear me? I'll be with you. And we looked at different passages, and towards the end of that message, we looked at this mirror again, and it said, you are forgiven. You are beautiful. You are a masterpiece. You are a child of God. And I I reasoned with you guys, and I said, hey, you cannot begin to love somebody else until you first love yourself. And the Apostle Paul, he always talks about in his letters, he always says, God, fill me up so I may be poured out again like a drink offering. See, Paul knew that he had to be filled up in order to be poured out. He knew that he had to be able to love himself before he could love other people. And then I closed the message with this idea of Jesus talking to people. And they said, Jesus, what's the most important of the Ten Commandments? He says, I'll do you one better. Let's condense the the ten down to two. Make it easier to remember. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And do you remember what else he said? The second one was... Love your neighbor as yourself. And I told you, I think that Jesus said that because he truly believed that you and I would love ourselves in a healthy manner. That we would get to the point where we'd look in the mirror and we'd say, I am forgiven. I am beautiful. I am a masterpiece. I am a child of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. So let me ask you guys this. I I challenge you to put reminders up. How many of you guys got reminders put up? Nobody. Nobody put a reminder up. Come on now. These reminders, one, these reminders of I am beautiful. I am wonderful. I am a masterpiece. I am a child of God. Guys, you need those reminders in your life. I don't care where you put them. I don't care if it's on your mirror. I don't care if it's on your, somewhere in your car or on your fridge or on your laptop or your computer at work. Put it somewhere. Because at some point during your day, it's going to get stressful. And you're going to think, man, this sucks. Or you're going to think, man, I'm no good. And at that point, you need a reminder to say, hey, I got you. Just like Moses, I'm with you. You are good enough. You are a masterpiece. You are my child, and I'm proud of you, so keep going. Love others like God has loved us. That's what we're talking about today. Loving others. So, let me ask you this, church. Do you find it easy to love others? Sometimes, over these next three weeks, I'm going to do a lot of uh, Q&A. 
Emphasis on the A. I need you guys to answer back to me, okay? Let's work with me here. Do you find it easy to love others? Sometimes. Okay. Very good. Now let me ask you this. Do you find it easy to love others that are outside of your comfort zone? That you may be a little uncomfortable with, a little uneasy with? No. No. I want to share an illustration with you guys. I got a buddy who I did um, houseless with. This homeless minister we did in college, we started up. And he called me a couple weeks ago. And he said, hey, I'm going to this Bible study again. I said, is this the same one you went to last time that you didn't really like? He said, yeah. He said, Shay, the reason I have so much trouble going to this Bible study is because I'm surrounded by these Christians that think they got it all together. They think that they, they, they don't just know it all, but they got it all together and like, it's almost like they're perfect. And he said, man, I struggle with that. He said, I find it easier. I find it easier to talk with, to share life with, and to communicate with somebody who's got a needle in their arm strung out on heroin than I can with a Christian that thinks they have it all together. And as he told me that, I said, you know, i I got to agree with you on that. It's easier for me to communicate with somebody who's transparent, with somebody who says, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to put it all out on the line for you. We worked with homeless people for years. And I came in contact with people who were on drugs, who were drunk, who were being prostituted and sold. And guys, I tell you, it's easier to communicate with them than with a Christian who is narrow-minded and says, I've got it all together. I don't need accountability from a brother or sister, and I don't need help from you. Because let's be honest, church, every one of us in here needs accountability from the other. And every one of us in here needs somebody to walk along this walk with them that we call faith. And so Nate said this, and I said, man, I'm going to use that for my sermon, because I, like, I, I feel it. So we're going to start in the book of John. It's the third gospel. John, go ahead and throw that on the screen for me. John chapter 15. And Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, look, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone should lay down his life for his friends. Okay. I can deal with that. Love one another as I have loved you. So I have to ask you guys this. Is that possible? Is it possible? Is it obtainable for us to love God as much as he's loved us? And I would, I would beg and I would say that it's not obtainable, but it's Definitely something we are striving for every single day. God says, look, love as I have loved you. We're not going to be able to love as fully as God has loved us because he is God. But he's saying, I've set the bar this high. You're not going to get there. But that's a good thing. At least I think so for myself because a lot of times, and there may be some other people in here that do this, but we get to that bar and we're like, all right, made it. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to plateau. I'm going to cruise. God says, you are constantly going to strive for this. You are going to love others as I have loved you. And I said, all right, I can love my friends. I can love my family. He says, no, there is no boundaries to others. He says, no, the greater love has no more than this than to lay down a life for a friend. Guys, Christ sets the example so that we could follow his calling. Christ says, look, you have seen how I loved you. Love others as I have loved you, Peter. As you say stupid stuff at, that comes to your mind and I have to rebuke you in front of other people. Love them as I still love you, Peter, as you're going to deny me three different times. Love them as I have loved you when you doubted that I raised to life. Love them as I have loved you when I was going to be crucified and as I hung there on the cross and only one of you will be there. Love them as I have loved you. Christ sets the example so that we can follow in the calling. Is it easy to love somebody you don't know? This is the, the A, the answer. No, we're going to get there, trust me. Okay, is it easy to love your enemies? No, well that was a fast one, wasn't it? You didn't even have to think about that one. Is it easy to love your enemies? You say no. Guys, I'm here to tell you um, that we're supposed to love our enemies too. And that's hard. That's hard. 
When's the last time that, how many of you guys are like, yes, I've prayed in the past week for somebody else, right? Okay, good, good, good. How many of you guys can say, hey, I prayed for my enemy in the past week? A couple of you. I can't. I just didn't think about it. It's just not something that's on the, the front of my mind, but we're called to pray and love on our enemies too. First Peter says this. Go ahead and throw that on the screen for me. First Peter says, above all, above everything else, keep on loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Above everything else, church, love. Because love allows forgiveness. Love allows for grace. Throw the next passage up there. First John. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So we had the passage before it says love above everything else because it has the power for you to forgive. It has the power for you to give grace and for grace to be given to you. And now we see a passage that says love because love pushes out fear. Love doesn't allow fear to creep in. When you love earnestly, fear is not allowed to be there. This is an odd passage. Love and fear is not allowed to be there. Love and sins can be forgiven. Christ set the example so we could follow in the calling, and this is what these disciples are writing about. He's saying love earnestly, because when you love, you're able to forgive. He says love so much so that you don't fear what the consequences are going to be. That you don't fear what others are going to think when you're sitting there with people that are eh, a little questionable. Mark chapter 2, Jesus is calling Levi the tax collector. He says, Levi, come and follow me. And he does, and Levi invites him over for dinner. So Jesus and all of his disciples are hanging out at Levi the tax collector's house. And if you remember correctly, the religious leaders come in and they say, Jesus, what's up, man? Why are you hanging out with these broken sinners? And if you remember, Jesus says, look, it's not the healthy I came for that need a doctor. It's the broken. It's the hurting that I came to save. Jesus isn't just calling us to love each other in here. He's not just calling us to love ourselves. He's calling us to go out beyond our comfort zones and love the very people that you're just like, ah, maybe not. Church, that's what he is doing. Can I tell you a story? Okay, the three of you that want to hear it, thank you. The rest, go ahead and sleep. That's fine, whatever you need to do. All right, I'm going to tell you a story. We worked with the homeless downtown Knoxville, right? I told you about this a million times. You're like, Shay, you talk about every sermon. It's because God is good. And he works through things like this. One of the guys we met when we first got down there, my sophomore year of college, his name was Tony. Okay? Tony is about gay tall, a little shorter than I am, African American, got a little Jufro. Awesome guy. But man, was he ignorant. Every time we saw him, he was, he was yelling and cursing and spitting and this and that. And he was belligerent. I'd give him a sandwich. My dude would throw the sandwich on the ground. He'd stomp on it. I'd give him a bottle of water. He'd chuck it across the street. I'm like, if you hit somebody's car, that's on you, not me. And this man was rude. I got to be honest with you, church. I like 90s hip-hop, okay? Don't judge me on that. I like Tupac. I like Biggie, okay? I like those guys. That's my kind of music. And so at one time or another, I had about three or four different Tupac shirts. And I'd wear those downtown to be conversation starters. Just like many of you guys come to me and you say, Shay, why do you have tattoos and what do these tattoos mean? Those are my conversation starters. Those are my ways in. Okay? And so I'd wear this Tupac shirt, and so many times people would be like, hey, can I get that shirt? And I'm like, no, I'm not walking around here naked. So no, you cannot have my shirt. Well, one day I'm walking. Tony comes up to me, and I'm like, oh, here we go. Tony's going to take a sandwich. He's going to throw it at me. He's going to take my water. He's going to throw it all over the place. I'm not ready for this. He comes up to me. He's like, what's up, bro? So what's good, Tony? I don't know nothing much. You know, he gives me a whole rundown of how, how life's terrible, and he hates it, and all right. And he looks at me and says, bro, let's trade shirts. Mind you, Tony is not a small man, or Tony is a small man, and I am not. Tony is shorter than I am. He's thinner than I am. This shirt that I'm wearing is already a size too big. It's a 3XL. 
It's freaking huge. I'm like, Tony, he said, let's trade shirts. I said, you really want to? So let me get this right. If we trade shirts, that means I get yours and then you get mine. So I'm not walking around here naked. Yeah. And I don't know what it was because so many people had asked me up to this point, yo, let me, give me, let me get your shirt. And I kept saying, no, no. And Tony said, let's trade shirts. And at that moment, I said, all right. And I took my shirt off and Tony took his shirt off. And uh, as I was putting on this man's shirt, I could smell the alcohol. I could smell the urine. I could smell the drugs. And it was, it was gross. It was the worst thing I had ever encountered in the entire world. And as I pulled it over my head and I got it through my arms, I looked and Tony had tears streaming down his face. And I said, what's up, man? And he said, why would you do that? I said, what are you talking about? He said, why did you give me your shirt? I said, Tony, it's because I love you, man. He said, what? I said, I love you. I don't just come down here and feed you so I can check a box off my to-do list. I don't just come down here and feed you so I can say, oh, I'm a good Christian. I come down here and do this because I love you. I come down here and do this not because God calls me to do it, because there's something inside of my heart that says, I need you in my life. I love you. I want to walk the walk with you. I want to talk the talk with you. I want to do stuff with you, Tony. You're not alone, and I love you. And as I said this, this man walked away, and he just said he was crying. And I thought, man, I'm never, I don't know what's going to happen after that. He could walk away with that shirt and that could be that. So hold on to that story. Let's keep going. I say all that and I show you these passages to say this. The power of Jesus Christ is magnified through the love that we give other people, church. I tell my students almost weekly, that you have the power, you have the chance to change and alter somebody's day, every single day. That is beautiful. But it also, it's also a weapon. Because let's be honest, I, I worked fast food for a number of years. There were some rude people that come through there with agendas. Many of you guys have worked customer service. There's some rude people in there that come with their own agendas and they can tear you down. But they can also build you up. Your love of Jesus that you give to other people, that you, that you say and that you do, it magnifies Jesus. It does crazy things. Genesis 33, chapter, or chapter 33, verses 1 through 4. There's a story of two brothers. Their name is Jacob and Esau. And Esau, um, he's a hunter out in the field a lot. And Jacob, he's, um, he's a homebody. And really what ends up happening is Jacob ends up stealing a lot from Esau. His inheritance, his birthright. And then he's like, oh, my brother's not going to take this very well, so I'm, I'm, I'm heading out. So he leaves. And God blesses Jacob immensely through his birthright, through the blessing of his father and the inheritance. And verses 1 through 4 talk about Jacob coming back to meet Esau. Now, as you can imagine, Esau has had time to stew. He's had time to process. He's had time to think. This man has stolen pretty much everything from Esau. And Jacob, he has been blessed immensely. And he's like, I got to go back to my, visit my brother. So he does it strategically. He says, Jacob lifted up his eyes and he looked. Behold, Esau was coming. And he's thinking, oh my gosh, here comes Esau. He's not going to be happy. So I'm going to do this strategically. So maybe after he does some damage to what I what I've put in front, maybe as he gets to me, he'll realize I'm his brother and that he loves me. And Esau was coming with 400 men. That's not a welcome party, right? You don't, you don't bring 400 men and say, hey, I'm glad you're home. He's like, oh, this is bad. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants he had. He put the servants with their children in the very front. Then Leah with her children, Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him. He embraced him. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. And they wept. 
Esau had every reason to despise Jacob. He had every reason to want to kill Jacob. And instead, he ran to Jacob. He threw his arms around him. He said, brother, I'm so glad you're here. I love you so much. Thank you for coming. And the power of Jesus Christ was magnified through Esau saying, brother, it's all good. You did me wrong. But I still love you. I still love you. So Tony, he'd been in and out of in and out of prison, and uh, I hadn't seen him for a while. And the last time I saw Tony, here he come, bouncing up the street. And he had something in his hand. I was like, what in the world? He had a stuffed animal monkey. I was like, oh, this has got to be good. I said, what's up? He said, oh, it's me and Tony Jr. Well, what are you doing? Oh, we're just picking up ladies. Me and Tony Jr. All right. <laughs> so he grabs me, and I'm like, I'm not a lady. Leave me alone. And he starts dragging me down the street. He says, i got to show you something. All right. I'm like, guys, Tony's taking me down the street. Watch me. I don't know what he's going to do. He's trying, dum, 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 dum. We get up to this guy, probably close to seven foot tall, white, long white beard, the complete opposite of Tony. I'm like, oh, sweet goodness. What is about to happen? He says, you see that guy? I say, yep. And this guy had a Leonard Skinner shirt on. He said, you see that shirt? I say, yeah. He said, that was my shirt. I gave him my shirt because you gave me your shirt. And it was at that moment that I knew that after three years of doing this homeless ministry, that seeds had been planted. That the love of Jesus Christ that I was able to give to Tony was now being magnified because this man that stood before me three years ago that was ignorant, that was belligerent, was able to do ministry of his own. And he looked at me and he said, that was my shirt. I did that because you did that for me. I love that person because you first loved me. Now, can I hope you guys hand out sandwiches today? And that whole night, Tony went up and down the streets with us and he handed out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bottles of water. And it was at that very moment that I fully understood what it means to love as Christ has loved me. And it was at that moment that I realized that there is no one, church, and if you don't hear anything else today, please, please, please hear this. There is no one that doesn't deserve to hear and feel and see the love of our Lord and Savior. Not a single soul on this earth no matter your political background, no matter what you've done, no matter what you are doing or what you're going to do, there is no one that doesn't deserve to see and to feel and to hear the love of God. And I'm telling you this today and I'm so passionate about this because it has impacted me in such a way. To be able to love somebody as Christ has loved you means the world. Not only to Christ, but it will mean the world to you. Ministry is the most exhausting and spiritually and emotionally and physically exhausting thing you will ever do in your entire life. But it is also the most spiritually rewarding, emotionally rewarding, and physically rewarding thing you will ever do in your entire life. And Jesus says, love the church as I have loved you. Because you never know when you're going to be, Tony. You never know when you're going to be down and out and you're going to need somebody to say, hey, I love you. Hey, I understand. And you never know what seed you're going to plant, what fruit may be born. I don't know what Tony's doing. I don't know if he's in or out of jail. I do know I, I have this shirt here. That reminds me every so often of what God does when you begin to love like he loves. Of what God does when you say, God, this isn't really my comfort zone, but I trust that you are doing something special. See, church, at that point in my life, I love myself. I could look at my mirror and I could say, yes, you are broken and you are a sinner, but you are covered by the grace of God. Yes, you do have shortcomings, but you are a child of God and you are a beautiful masterpiece. And at that point, I knew that God could use me if I allowed him to. And so he did. He said, hey, I want you to go minister with homeless people. 
And that one day, he said, hey, I, I know you really like that shirt, but I want you to give it to Tony. And I did. And for three years, never heard anything back from Tony. I mean, yeah, we came in contact with him. He was still belligerent. He was still rude. And for three years, we prayed for Tony and the other people downtown. And for three years, I thought, it didn't do anything, did it, God? It didn't do anything. Until that day when Tony walked me down the street and he showed me this gentleman and he said, because you love me, I have loved somebody else. So here's my challenge for you, church. I want you to step out of your comfort zone. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what that looks like for you. I know what it looks like for me. For me at the time, it was going downtown Knoxville. And now... You guys want to know what's out of my comfort zone? You want to be honest with you? It's when I have to walk around this church on Sunday and talk with each one of you individually. Not because of anything you've done, but just because it's so much easier for me to talk with somebody who's got nothing to lose. It's so much easier for me to talk with somebody who shows me all their dirt right off the bat. And I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just letting you know where my comfort zone lies. And my challenge for you, and you have to pray about it, is to step out of your comfort zone. To love those that you say, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't, I'm not so sure about it. And I promise you this, church, I promise you that when you begin to step out of your comfort zone and say, God, who do you want me to love? Well, he's going to do some crazy, awesome things with you. And I'm telling you that as living proof. And you may not see it that day, and you may not see it that week or that month or even that year. And you, church, you may never see it. But know that you are planting seeds and that you are bearing fruit. Because God said, I love you. I want you to love yourself. And in doing so, I want you to love others and magnify my love that much more. If that's not... A beautiful, beautiful love. If that's not something that you look at and say, this is crazy. This is crazy that the creator of the universe would say, I want you. And I love you. If that doesn't just rattle your mind, I don't know what will. And if, and if, you, if you want to know what it's like to have that relationship. To say, I want to, I want to be... Known by God. Not just know God, but I want to know God. And I want Him to know me. I want to be a child of God. I want to make the physical statement that I believe that Jesus came, that He died for me, that He raised the life, He defeated death, and He's still sitting there saying, I believe in you. I love you. You're beautiful and you are mine. If that's you and you want to know what that looks like to have that relationship with Jesus Christ and to make that first time commitment, come talk to me. Because church, if you can't tell by now, that's not something I just want to keep to myself. I want to let everybody know, and that's my prayer for each one of you in here, is that when you're at work, when you're at the grocery store, when you're pulling through the drive through that you can look at somebody and say, how are you doing today? That you can look at somebody and you can be the Jesus that somebody needs to see that very day. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you give us. We thank you for this day, and I just thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your love, for grace that covers us so much. God, I thank you for Tony. I thank you for this church and everybody in between that you put in my life to allow me to love on and for them to love on me and to love on others. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, and I thank you for the significant and most astounding example of love through his body on the cross and his raising from the grave three days later. Father God, I pray right now that you continue to be with us in our time of worship and of praise and song. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit moves here now. Pray this in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing.